we are here as uh, into starting off and premiering our first and the first episode of uh, the citizens chat and uh, we'll be going live we'll be going live into these discussions and they will be happening every friday so this is the citizens agenda that we want to engage we want to see how we can forge the way uh, for, for 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 the future because this is a, an agenda that we should own as all the citizens of Uganda, and we should be able to at least add or add our voices to, to, to this uh, uh, programming. This agenda is not for, for the opposition, but it's an entire agenda for, for all the citizens. So today we'll be here, I'm joined by a serious panel of uh, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen over the, the mighty citizens uh, platform. The platform has been around for, for, it's now getting into six years of existence. We've been discussing issues, we've been discussing all that has been happening, the top events in the country. So it's a time that we bring these conversations to the people. It's a time that we make these conversations live, physical, that we could add our voices. And from here, we need to see that uh, whatever is discussed here, the space is free, and can go live to, to and go far into changing the course of discourse in the country, but also to the sector players to make sure that uh, they can implement some of uh, uh, what we'll have discussed and what we'll have come up with as uh, the way forward into some of these discussions. These discussions will be live, and uh, also we'll have uh, a live audience that will be with us, that will join us, and we'll be answering questions that will be coming from that side. Uh, joining from the panel of uh, our, our, our panelists today, I'll start from uh, the far right. We are joined by uh, Henry Muguzi. Henry Muguzi is uh, the Executive Director of Alliance for Campaign Financing and Monitoring. Campaign Finance Monitoring, yeah, it's, uh, it's a civil society organization that, uh, uh, that has been active in, uh, in our political space here. Many of you have, have seen it in the news, you've seen it all over. And Henry here is, uh, is not a, a very old face. It's a, I mean, a very new face into the media. He's an old face that has been discussing and around uh, elections. He's been so, so instrumental. And also, uh, on his left, we have uh, uh, Sarah Bilete. Sarah is the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Governance. Also, we need to note that Sarah is uh, the brain behind the citizens' chat. Uh, the few people they decided to, to have this forum, this platform where many other citizens can engage freely and on topical issues. Sarah is executive director of the Center for Constitutional Governance and she's also not a very old face. I mean a very uh, new face onto the media. She's an old face that has been around. We've been seeing her throughout into this also this political uh, uh, spaces. She's been all over the media discussing uh, some of these uh, issues. So. Today, we, we are also privileged to have her uh, around. Uh, next to, to Sarah is the one and only uh, Professor Mushemeza. Professor Mushemeza has been one of uh, the political people in the country. He's a politician that has been around in the back doors of NRM. Now he has decided to come at the forefront. He's the MPL elect of uh, Shema South. And uh, we, we are honored to have you, uh, Professor, into this uh, inaugural uh, engagement for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nomisitu. Next to me here is uh, uh, Winnie Wait. Nakan. She's been around the youth, know her quite well. She's the, just the former uh, chairperson of the, the National Students Association, Musa, Uganda National Students Association, Musa. She's, she was formerly the, the dual president of Chambogo before she joined Musa. She's the chairperson of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the ladies of um, PG district. And she also runs an organization uh, called Mchana. Mchana. Uganda. It's, it's a Israeli word for Girl. the girls. Yeah. Ah, okay. So here the panel is set. Uh, we, we apologize for, for the delays in, in timing, but we've been, of course, uh, running. So we're happy to, that we, we can start off with this programming. So right away into our, our topical uh, 
question of the day. So we, today we are discussing what is the citizens' uh, post-election agenda in Uganda. And uh, if you're on social media, all our social media platforms are active, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, you can join us into this discussion. Put, post there your comments, post there your, your, your questions, we shall capture them and also add on to, on to the discussion for today. Also, we are running into a hashtag, uh, uh, Chat Show Uganda. So you need to go to Chat Show Uganda and drop there your comment onto Twitter. The hashtag is trending, it's running right now. So to start with the discussion, we'll start with you, Sarah. Because of course, you, 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 the, the, the forum, you know where the forum started. So we need to also do the ice breaking for, for us. But to begin with, I need to ask uh, a question. Uh, what is your post-election move? What do you see as a post-election move as of now? Good afternoon, viewers, and uh, good afternoon, my fellow panelists. Uganda in the post-election period, since really January, February, and March that we have started, I think the key word that defines this, this period is violence. If you look at the way campaigns were conducted, voting day, voting day we extended from digital, physical violence to digital violence in the digital shutdown, which lasted, I think, complete shutdown lasted nine days. And uh, you know, the, the, those days should be documented as days of darkness in the digital era. And then we reached, we went into the physical easing of, of internet freedoms. But the kidnaps and disappearances of citizens then took an upper hand. And they, as far yesterday, the minister, the government of Uganda, first of all, cannot account for the whereabouts of the citizens. And as per yesterday, the Minister of Internal Affairs, after a long, you know, struggle by Parliament, did present a list of 177 missing persons, and 90% uh, of his list, their whereabouts are in, in military detentions, and these are civilians. So we have two situations playing out. First is the government that cannot follow or act by the laws of the land. We have the security forces that have turned in themselves into a militia. And we have a government that is holding citizens in military detentions, court marshalling them amidst you know, a celebration of 25 years of the constitution. We are glad that on the panel we have uh, Professor Mshemeza, who was as, as, as a, a useful firebrand leader, who was a member of the Constituent Assembly. If you look at the consensus that was generated by the 1995 Constitution, and the government that has not changed since then, you know, you have a government presiding over the birth of a new constitutional era but also presiding over the death of a new constitution, of, of the constitutional era that they ushered in. And I think it's a very sad moment for the Straight I want to, to, to get to Professor Mshemeza. She has uh, really uh, poked you a little. So we need to see how do you weigh, is what she's saying uh, the right position from your angle. Now you've been into, into just uh, had a very tight dress into your constituents. So what, do you, what do you weigh from, from picking from what she has just said? Uh, thank you, moderator. I think there is a mixed reaction as far as the mood is concerned. There are those who are celebrating that they won. Whether they won fairly or unfairly, there are those in a celebrating mood. There are those actually who are also in another mood of uh, experiencing violation of their rights. So that's why if you ask me, like the theme of this uh, show is concerned, like what would be the immediate agenda for the citizens, it should be reconciliation. Because in the contestation, you get those two perspectives. Uh, those who will feel that they have succeeded and those who might feel that they did not succeed because the playing field is not leveled. 
Now, if you have such a situation, and if the country is to move, and given the perspective Sarah is giving, then reconciliation becomes very, very, very significant as far as, as uh, uh, the mood, the desirable mood uh, after elections. That's what I could say briefly. Henry, uh, you've been uh, close to, to, to the elections happening, and uh, possibly you've done part of the observation, and also you've been uh, uh, monitoring how uh, the elections have been moving out and uh, spanning out. Uh, from your point of view and from your mandate of election financing, uh, what do you see and uh, how, how do you weigh the, 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 how the elections have turned out, how they turned out uh, financially? Do they have any implication on, uh, on the economy? And uh, what, is, what do you see as the move of, uh, of this time? Thank you, moderator. Uh, of course, um, before even getting to the mood uh, in the arena of uh, financing the election, uh, it's important to not pay attention. Uh, it's not uh, possible to not pay attention to the people, the things that are raising uh, uh, citizen anxiety, the uncoordinated and, uh, and uh, contradictory statements of the numbers of citizens of Uganda that have uh, uh, been held uh, um, in communicado, but also uh, in circumstances where it's not clear whether they are still alive or not. Um, uh, of course, those who participated in the election will tell you that uh, 2021 was one of the most expensive they have ever seen. And uh, to tell you frankly, we have quite a number of candidates that uh, are still seriously bru bruised uh, as a consequence of st spending themselves dry. And of course, uh, Professor Mshemeza will let her to that. But, 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 oh, but, but and, and, and of course, the, the, this is applying to both uh, the victors and the, uh, and the losers. And the take home we, we are getting, uh, we, are we are having as, a, as a, a democracy activists is uh, whether or not this is the, the path we want to, 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 to take. Um, I cannot uh, 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 proceed without uh, adding my voice to uh, the escalation of tensions the old principle used to be that when you emerge victorious, you should do, nature de demands, that, demands that you should be kind and magnanimous. And so for the government in power, having been declared winner, uh, you, would, you would expect that the president would now understand that he's a president of all Ugandans. And therefore it is, it is uh, of no consequence to keep uh, witch hunting uh, and, 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 and this pretending over the disappearance, continually disappearance, maybe escalating as well, of those young men and women who are uh, presumed not have been uh, supportive uh, of the patent power. So these are some of the things that are raising anxieties and uh, I think uh, uh, any sane Ugandan ought to, to, to get concerned. Thank you. So we would want to see, uh, are the youth convinced that uh, the elections uh, uh, responded to what they, they, they desired and uh, how are they uh, trying to, 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 to fit into the current uh, situation and moving forward. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, viewers. Um, this particular previous election, uh, most importantly, attracted the attention of young people. Young people have always been part of election processes, although this time around they've been, they've, they've actively engaged, they've been actively engaged as not only cheerleaders and fans and supporters, but also as candidates and aspirants and also elected leaders. So this season has had a lot of young people participate in politics. However, the post-election period, this that we're still in, is uh, characterized by anxiety and fear amongst young people. 
Uh, and you know this does not does not only go to the does not only involve the numbers that are stated as missing, but also to the bigger families of those people. Uh, in some circumstances, people have been kidnapped. People are said to be picked by drones, yet they do not appear on the list that was released by government just recently. So the families of these people are wondering. They've looked everywhere. They've searched everywhere. They've searched in mortuaries. They've searched everywhere. And government does not have answers as to where their people are. It is, it is, uh, it is characterized by anxiety and fear in amongst young people. But on the other hand, I'm glad that many young people have taken up leadership positions, especially at local government level. It's important to note that uh, the young people were, were real active into these elections. And uh, possibly, uh, Professor Mshemeza, you can agree and attest to that, that uh, we had a high turnout of young people. Uh, maybe to, to also dig deep into the issue of uh, sec security. You notice the security expert and possibly you don't, uh, but for, for we need to, to, to bring out this uh, clearly. Uh, we, the security minister released the list of, uh, of, uh, of, of course, those that they, 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 they say they have into, into, these, uh, into uh, their hands. And uh, like Winnie is saying that there are those that are off the list. But uh, then we also know that the, the, the government's position is that uh, these were security threats. Yeah? They, they, were, they were trying to do all this uh, for security. Uh, reasons and because these young people were being security threats. So what, what, what is the position for you on that? Do you, do you think, do you mm. see that, are there other young people missing or the list that was really, really shared out is the, the actual one? And uh, are, with this, we shall we see these young people getting a fair hearing at the end of the day? Before I talk about the list, uh, brother, let me say there is concern about national security, uh, sometimes which is narrowly defined as regime security. Of course, these are not the same things. Uh, but even if it was defined narrowly, uh, this has to be uh, weighed in relation to the rights of citizens. Uh, citizens have rights and also have duties, uh, according to the Constitution. So you see, on one hand, uh, state actors, particularly in the government, raising the issue of national security. On the other hand, you have actors who want to challenge the regime, and they have a legitimate right to do so. Now, the question is, how do you balance uh, the relationship between concerns to protect national security and also allow those who legitimately have the right to challenge you in terms of, of leadership positions. And then it goes also again on what methods of struggle are being used on those who are challenging the state. Because the methods of the struggle may also determine the response of the state actors. But coming down to the issue of, of lists, I think people's representatives, like in parliament, have acted very well. Uh, I watched on television the speaker saying, whoever has a list of missing citizens, it should be brought forward. To me, as people's representative and the speaker, that was a, a right thing. Now, the onus is on state actors to ensure that these people, this situation is investigated. There should be no Ugandan who should not be accounted for. You cannot just uh, uh, disappear and uh, uh, from the NRM ideology and the NRM actors as I have known, uh, we have always emphasized that people, citizens should not just disappear. So now here is a situation where people's representatives in parliament are saying they are, in the, they are missing citizens. Now that the lists have been submitted by people's representatives in parliament, I think the state and the government that is running the state <coughs> has the responsibility to investigate and explain to the all Ugandan citizens where these people are. 
So uh, it is a concern to everyone and also a concern to me as a citizen that no Ugandan, no citizen should just disappear. And the responsibility is on the state actor, those running the government. To in, they have the investigative machinery to explain and find out where these citizens are. And if we don't do that, it will damage us among citizens first, because uh, uh, the mood in the country is that no citizen should disappear. It will also damage us internationally, because we are signatories to all these international instruments that are protecting the human rights at regional level, uh, even if you talk of Great Lakes region, East Africa, at continental level, at global level, there's no way as a country we can say people have disappeared and we cannot account for them. We are talking about young people disappearing. Uh, we, we, we are seeing uh, the concerns of, of uh, all the political parties who would want to come on and, and be players into, into uh, the, the process as it's going so that we could have, now we're talking about the post-election. Do you think this is the time we could have uh, a, a conversation as a people of the country, a national dialogue kind of uh, a process that would uh, allow us to heal and uh, see that we, we can have a, a beautiful Uganda? I, I, I think life, life comes first. You know, the definition of a state or a nation is twofold. One is the territorial integrity or the boundaries of a country, and two is the people. So for Uganda not to be a mere geographic expression, the citizens must thrive. And if a regime has a mentality that they will wipe out whoever doesn't support them, they, they should uh, be well aware or reminded that the international laws on genocide, crimes against humanity, and the extinction of a particular group, then we'll come into play. Because what we are saying, we are seeing is a particular witch hunt against people who do not support NRM. I have not had any NRM supporter anywhere missing or missing their children. The people crying are those whose children supported opposition candidates or whose parents, and, and it's important to note, moderator, that it's, only, it's not only youth that are missing. I think there's a clip of an old man on NTV saying his 62-year-old wife has been missing since January 6th, and he says he could be consoled by finding her body and laying her to rest in dignity. You know, th this, this is the, 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 the condition that, that citizens are being subject to. By, by, by President Museven as the Commander-in-Chief of the Security Forces. It's also important to draw lessons from countries like Nigeria, and important to emphasize that in other countries, citizens' lives are threatened not by the official leadership, but by military regime or rebels like Boko Haram. But in our case, you have CMI, you have military police, you have the army, you know, constitutional security bodies, organs of the state, participating in the disappearance and kidnap of citizens. It is unheard of and very abnormal. And, and we should be able, you know, to call a spade a spade. You cannot have a government kidnapping their people. At least Nigeria is struggling with Boko Haram, and we know Boko Haram is a rebel. But in this country, you have people mandated to protect Ugandans and paid by a taxpayer to protect Ugandans, abusing their offices to participate in the extinction of the opposition. Uh, Sarah, but you know there's, uh, there, there's been a uh, post the, the, when the, 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 the pressures were high, the, the issue of, of uh, we, Uganda will be Libya kind of talk and what? What what could be could that be have been the reason why some of these you are see, seen? The because then we need to. It does not matter. I know these organs are mandated to protect every Ugandan. They are also mandated to secure the country. So if there are elements of insurgency, 
And I think due process take place. We have rules to deal with such a situation. Arrest, why do you arrest people after midnight from their beds? Why don't you come to the same home and arrest them at 6 a.m., which is illegally okay? Why do you have to come after midnight? Why do you cover your face with a mask? Are you also an insurgent? How different are you from the people you are arresting if the, the, the excuse is security? How different are you from rebels, from militias? How different are you? Interesting. So we could uh, possibly hear from uh, Henry. What is your perspective? Yeah, you see, you see uh, I want to pick it up from where Sarah left it and say that what is happening is the what you can describe as a immoral. Because you see, you cannot have a government kidnapping its own people. You cannot have a government that uh, has trivialized the state institutions, so trivialized that they have, they have, they have been diverted from, from executing the legitimate roles that are, that are legally defined by the laws of this country and, tr and, 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 and concentrating on, 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 on projects that are aimed to sustain uh, uh, and maintain the regime in power. Earlier on, Professor Mushemeza brought in a very interesting dynamic, <coughs> the dynamic of uh, regime security and national security. What's happening now and what we are seeing is that uh, any opposition against the regime, which is legitimate, because you see, the regime has to go. That's why we went down the path of multi-party, that this regime, towards election, we can have an opportunity to, to, to reward it, uh, by voting for, for, for it to stay or punish it by voting it out. And that's legitimate. And therefore, for, for them to misconstrue opposition to the, to the party or the regime uh, as, 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 as a treasonable act, uh, I, I think uh, is immoral. And therefore, uh, these are some of the things that uh, I, I, I think are worrying to any uh, uh, Ugandan and the PPC loving the, uh, stakeholder out there that we together as a country, and uh, I'm happy we talked about uh, dialogue. These are things we need to, 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 to dialogue around. This is a situation where we need to cease fire. Uh, we need to come together and, 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 and agree on what kind, kind of country we want to have as Ugandans. We do, none of us wants to, 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 to receive violence. All of us love our country. It is also wrong for a few individuals to think they are more patriotic than others. Uh, that is also wrong. Uh, and therefore, I think until we have come together as a country and had a dialogue on where we want to take our country. And of course, you see what is happening and uh, sometimes you even lose it because you see, you wonder whether um, uh, we are headed for, for something akin to what King Louis the 15th of France said. Because we remember very well that King Louis the Fifteenth of France said, "A prem, a prem, moi de la luge," that after me that the floods go, and indeed after him the floods went off. We don't want floods after this after the regime has gone, okay? And so these are things we need to dialogue around and listen to each other. We need to understand that respect for the rights and freedoms of every citizen is critical. That you cannot live in a country where you are you 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 are denying people their birth rights because you've been told by, by, by Sarah and others that everybody is born with certain inalienable rights, such as the right to life, the right to, 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 to what? To um, liberty, education, but also the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. So you cannot have people that are, uh, you know, in a, uh, you know, drowned in anxiety, a, a citizen way that... <coughs> are struggling to cope with what is happening and losing their loved ones and think we have peace. I think these are things we need to seriously think about as Ugandans. Uh, Professor Mishemiza, we, we because then we are talking about uh, the process of having a conversation around our citizens to adopt an agenda as citizens, which is uh, feeding into possibly a national, what we would call a national uh, dialogue. But then you cannot enter into that process when you have people who are dissatisfied. Do you think this process was really uh, to, to the satisfaction of many, or that what we would call a free and fair process, according to, to your take? And you, who has been really uh, part in, at the forefront of 
this process of the elections? You see, you have to look at the process at various levels. Uh, you may find in some respects the process was fair and in some others it was not. Even if you take a case of a presidential election, there are some areas where people felt that the process went on, there was no intimidation, and the counting went on, and they are satisfied with the results. Uh, there are some areas where uh, people are really totally dissatisfied. Uh, so one may need to look at uh, maybe an audit. Uh, the Electoral Commission can take an audit. Uh, citizens can also take an audit and be able to, to say the situation was free and fair. But you uh, see, we had the presence of leader all over. Uh, we, the people who took part into the observation. You where I voted from, yes. my constituency, there was no military, for example. My constituency. In the neighboring constituency, uh, there was military. So it was not a homogeneous. And as a researcher, I cannot just make a blanket statement and say this was not free and fair or this was free and fair. I need to cut out some kind of more interrogation and look at various areas. Because I was a participant, very busy, confined in a narrow place, a constituency. I didn't take this overview as a researcher if I was not a participant. So I wouldn't make a blanket statement uh, or a statement from a position of knowledge that uh, uh, the, the process was free and fair or it was not. But what is very clear, there are dissatisfactions. Because when you see people going to court, it is not uh, something erasure to go to court. It means you are dissatisfied. Even those who are withdrawing their case, I don't think they are withdrawing it uh, in a jovial, happy mood. I don't think so. So having a conversation is, is a very good thing. But it, it cannot be just an immediate conversation. I have previously, on the government side, participated in what we called consultations. The opposition leaders were calling it dialogue. From the government perspective, we are calling it consultations. And at that point, some of the groups withdrew from that conversation. Because Under the title of the, of the Yes, yes, because those who were like the side I was in at that time, when we were talking of consultations, our understanding was that dialogue uh, comes at a time when you have two forces, more or less, with the same strengths, and you have no choice but to sit and talk. Mm. But the government side at that time was saying there is no such a threat to cause for dialogue. Mm. Uh, you, you see? Mm. So even from the word title dialogue, it can be an obstacle to a conversation. So that's why citizens well, in local governments, in civil society organization like uh, CG, uh, Constitutional Governance, and others need to, and also the methods you use to encourage dialogue, you also have to be strategic. Because if you use a language that is repairing, the government will not be comfortable to have a conversation with you. And I'm talking from experience. Yeah. So the, the, the language you use, to initiate a conversation. If you say now, you know, now this government has failed, uh, the military has taken over, we need to dialogue. Given from what I know, you are not going to have even a beginning of a conversation. So you need some kind of a, a strategy, some kind of a language, some kind of, in order to convince the other side to be in conversation with you, whether you call it dialogue or not. And definitely, in principle, I agree, we need a conversation. Because there are many citizens who are dissatisfied with what is going on. There are many citizens who feel that the process of changing leadership is not uh, working in terms of a revolved field. And there are those who think that they have defeated you, they are in charge, the winner takes it all. So when you have those two sides with very strong positions, you need, in a way, to come down to have a middle ground in order to start a meaningful conversation. Otherwise, you have a conversation on your side, and the other ones also have 
a conversation of celebration on the other side. So, as civil society activists, especially like this organization, you have to think through how do you bring uh, 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 actors in those two situations to a meaningful conversation. Because we have tried it before and it has not worked to have a meaningful conversation. Last night, Sarah was talking about iPod. If you are going to have a meaningful conversation in iPod, then you must have all the actors there. Trust. If the other actors are not there, I would agree that uh, this conversation will not bring something very meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, you see? So, uh, if civil society organizations, think tanks, are going to take a lead into engaging citizens into meaningful conversation, then the packaging of our messages has to be very strategic. There is uh, the issue of uh, the president talked about uh, he brought he brought these elections into a, tri a tribal line, sectarian and tribal line. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it, when we were talking about national dialogue and also trying to forge an agenda for, for all the Ugandans, mm -hmm. I, I think it is one of the things that we need to, to really have a honest uh, conversation around. Mm -hmm. Whether it is true that we, we the, 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 the trend of elections, because I'm coming from the observer point, where you, you, you took so much lead and you are the forefront. Uh, do you think really this would affect a conversation that would, uh, would uh, hinder an agenda for all the citizens to feed into? Well, the, maybe to build on from the basis of dialogue, and I, and I want to agree with the Professor Mshemiza, that with dialogue you need a different language. And I want to draw an example of, you know, the, our international community members who did meet the president from the European Union, Commonwealth, and other stakeholders, and intimated to the president that there is a need for dialogue because the elections were not genuine. He did respond that he knows everybody's address, and if he wants to talk to them, he, he will. <laughs> He knows where to find <laughs> any political leader. So the, the language, the, the, the language is very important. And, and going back to your question, you know, the, the president in his uh, speech after the after Electoral Commission announcing him as a winner, did he say, you know, no, not presidential words against Uganda and the Catholic. For, for not having supported him. So uh, as a citizen and a civic actor, I, I, I wondered about two, two issues. One is that the, the president has never got 100% in an election. And when he stood in, in 1980, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether he even reached the 2% in that election. So I don't know where he gets the idea that everybody should support him, because it has never happened. Two, I, I don't know whether he would prefer to, to, to run an opposite and, and have no election, because once you are contesting with people, th then it shows that you can't even get 100%. You can only assume that you would have scored 100% if you were alone in the race. So the, 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 the man and approach and, and the language, especially presidential, and, and, and I will concentrate on presidential because the Constitution bestows on to our president the title of Fountain of Honor. You know, that, that is not a charitable title. You must live up to the title as a Fountain of Honor and conduct yourself in a honorable manner. So when you lash at people who did not support you in a race where the country had 11 people through whom to make choices, are you conducting yourself in a, in a, a, a honorable manner? Are you living to the expectations of the framers of the Constitution that you are an embodiment of respect and a fountain of honor in this country? So, and if that is the demon, then uh, do we have conditions possible for dialogue and, and, and reconciliation in this country? <coughs> I, I, my answer would have been the negative. The young people were so much uh, key players into, into 
they just concluded the elections. And now we are still talking about uh, the issue of uh, conversation and the dialogue and, uh, and seeing that uh, we, 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 we can have an agenda that fits into all the people. Now, from, from uh, you know, I would want to hear the voice of the young people so much into, into this conversation. Uh, do you think we could have a, a honest uh, conversation, uh, an agenda that captures with the, with the young people taking on the center stage? And, uh, and do you think we can, have, we, we, we can see fruits coming out of that? Thank you. Uh, first of all, before the conversation happens, so before we even think of a conversation for nation building and reconstruction, harmonization, all parties need to be happy to begin with. There need to be intentional interventions by the ruling party to reduce tension amongst the people, amongst the people at large. Because the current space, the current political space does not actually facilitate such a conversation. There needs to be intervention to reduce the tension, to reduce the stress and anxiety amongst the people, because like the current kidnaps, for example, they undermine the constitutional provision for multi-party dispensation. You know? Like Sarah and other panelists were saying, we need to, to appreciate there is a multi-party dispensation, and all political parties need to feel safe. All political players need to feel safe. They need to feel protected by the constitution and the state that has the responsibility to protect them and to uphold the constitution. So yes, it would be a good thing to have such a conversation or such a dialogue. However, from what point do you come to the table? Do you come from a point of so much privilege and the other people from a point of torture, from a point of anxiety and stress. So it is important to reduce tension and, and first of all, the, because the ruling party and government in power has, has all it takes to clear the mess, I should say. And, and, and these unconstitutional arrests, like they were saying, this arrest number one, they are unconstitutional, the mode of arrest is unconstitutional. Because when everyone says they are not responsible for taking the people, then no one knows where they are. So if we go back to the rule of law and see that every arrest happens constitutionally, there is a methodology to follow that we all know, the constitutional methodology, uh, then people can feel safe. But now, people do not even feel safe after a talk show. People, do not fe people feel their security is threatened after a political talk show like this one. So government has work to do, security has work to do, and institutions must work around reducing the tension amongst the people at this moment in time. Okay. Uh, Henry, let's, we, we are now going to see uh, 35 years of a single law. Uh, 40. 40 years. We're headed for 40, yeah, 40 decades. 40 years of, uh, we are into 35 years of single law, now getting into, into the 40th. Uh, do, you, do you really see that, uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your view, what could be the new agenda of uh, the new government? Uh, what do you think should be that you, you've been around in the government or citizens? We we do talk about first the government. What is what we envisage? Then uh, we see what really the citizens can chip into that because there are priorities of the citizens that we need to talk about in light of, of uh, the forty years. I think uh, over the past uh, up about ten years. There's been a focus uh, on uh, building infrastructure. But I think going forward, what a Uga Ugandans want to see now is a government that is investing in its people. Because this is one thing that we have not seen over the last uh, uh, 35 years. Governments that want to get into middle income status invest in their people and therefore uh, it is one thing we'd want to see number two i think uh, there is a a sense in which uh, many of us peace loving ugandans would want to see uh, a semblance of political tolerance political tolerance that allows 
uh, democracy to thrive, but also that uh, would then uh, uh, guarantee that many of us believe in uh, elections as uh, one of the uh, most viable forms of governance. That if you want to get to power and you've lost an election, you can wait uh, uh, five years after which you'll have a chance. Okay? So these are things we want to see. But beyond that, I think uh, the, <coughs> the, 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 the witch hunt uh, on citizens and citizen organizing should also be relaxed. Because you cannot keep thinking that uh, you are going to have a citizen that is as, a, as dormant as it were in, 20, in, in, in 1986, uh, having gone through decades of trauma. And therefore, it is only normal that, 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 that citizen organizing escalates, I mean, uh, go, 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 goes uh, to, 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 to another level. So if we can have those, I think we can start um, as having a semblance of a, a country we believe in, uh, but most importantly, um, investing in, in people so that services can improve. Professor, do you have any take yes. on that? Yes, uh, I think he's right. We are now going into the economic realm of our discussion. I think investing in our people is very, very fundamental. Uh, even if we talk of physical and monetary policies, issues of taxation, issues of uh, uh, government expenditure, all these should be geared to increase aggregate demand, or what we call the purchasing power of a citizen. Uh, the purchasing power of citizen is very low. The income, the income they get. Now, if you are going to raise the purchasing power of citizens, then as a government and the state, we need to invest in the people. I agree with him. That one, there is no shortcut. This is what will uh, raise the, 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 the incentive for every citizen to have an activity that generates income. But before that happens, you need to invest in them. That's why like, I like this uh, program in the NDP3, National Development Plan, what we call agro-industrialization. The majority of citizens live in the agriculture sector. And there is no way you are going to increase the aggregate demand or their purchasing power without investing in agriculture, very massively. Because if you look at the budget of agriculture, then you cannot take agriculture as the backbone of this country. I want to see more investment in coffee so that it can earn more foreign exchange globally. If you want foreign exchange, you are not going to get it through the commercial market, the East African market. You must tap into the global market. And there are things that will tap in the global market, for example, coffee. The Chinese want a lot of coffee. So, to do that, you must invest in citizens, as he's saying. So, as a priority of government, I would like to see investment in the people, investment in agro-industrialization, and again, investment in fighting corruption. You know, there is corruption has perverted our society. Every sector, every sector, don't mention one sector, or every sector. Now, we need to release resources that are misused through corruption if we are to boost service delivery. I'm not sure whether the law was passed that if you are convicted of corruption, your route should be confiscated and taken back to the public pass. If it was not done, in my tenor's parliament, I will push it. If it has already been passed, I will come it. Money should return to the public pass from the corrupt and then injected in service delivery. Yes, we have institutions for fighting corruption, but we'd like to see these institutions bite. You know, you can have institutions which are not biting. We must see these institutions biting. 
So investment, we should invest in fighting corruption. It is not an easy war, but we must invest in it. Some countries in Africa have invested in it, and they have some returns. I would like to see that in the government agenda. And I believe if we carried out research among citizens, they would welcome it as an agenda. And that should be nonpartisan even. The issue of fighting corruption, the issue of agro-industrialization, the issue of in investing in our citizens should be a nonpartisan agenda. Thank you. Uh, Sara, we, we, we need to, to, to go deep into, into, uh, into the, that area of economics. 40 years. We're getting into 40 years. We, we are trying to see how we can move on as a country. Do you see any growth uh, over the, this, this period? Now, do you even say that we could have a more growth into the new government? Well, I will, I will uh, maybe briefly a rejoinder of what uh, Muguza and the professor have said on uh, the welfare of the people. You know, the welfare of the people, one is mental welfare, like now people are, you know, citizens' mental health is disturbed by kidnaps, disappearances, and a whole brutality and impunity mm -hmm. of our security forces. But from the mental, then the body needs to feed. So I, 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 I usually share conversations with the Kenyans who work at the airport each time I get an opportunity to, to be in Kenya. They loved Mai Chivachi for one thing, President Mai Chivachi. You know, he came in power with the slogan of the economy that works for all. And the citizens are test because if you look at, at the drivers and, and the people who organize luggage at airports, you know, and, and, and they tell you that they were able to feel the economy during Chivachi's tenure. So I think if you have an economy that trickles down to that extent, and then the local people, local service people, are able to feel it in their pockets, feel it in their, you know, in their lives, that an economy is working. So I, I think this would be one of, of the dreams of Ugandans. But on the issue of fighting corruption and then the welfare of the people, I think it is important to underscore the fact that now for two years, we do not have the chair of Uganda Human Rights Commission. And I think for one year, we do not have a substantive IGG in this country. I do not think that Uganda is short of human resource for people to replace the late Med Kagwa, may he rest in peace, or the, 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 the position that, that, that has fallen vacant in the office of the IGG. I do not think that we are short of people to occupy that space. But this shows you the lack of political commitment on the part of the appointing authority to show that, you know, the total disregard of human rights protection in this country, two years you cannot repress a head of a constitutional body. So that, that, the same applies to IGG. If, if, if you're saying that you're fighting corruption and you are not offering lip service for purposes of appeasing donors, uh, and trying to posture as a government that is concerned about corruption that you are presiding over. What is the reason for not appointing a substantive IGG? And how is that in office supposed to function, given that the prosecution role and sanction belongs only to the IGG, and now the IGG is running, carrying files back to DPP? So, I, 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 and my call to, 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 to MP Erect, Honorable Elijah, we hope that these are some <laughs> of the questions that you can raise in Parliament because it is an embarrassment. It is an embarrassment to your party, to the regime, and I rebuke citizens of this country who have faith in these state institutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we, we need to dig deeper into, into the economics. And, uh, Getting on to onto, onto the priorities possibly that would, would serve for, for the citizens. And uh, also 
trying to, to from uh, the Afrobarometer survey uh, of, uh, I think, 2019, before, before COVID really interrupted, uh, 34, over the 34 countries in Africa, the, the, the key of, of what came out was unemployment. Uh, do, you, do you think we could have, and this is across, do you think we could, we could see that going forward, the, the, the government should, should have uh, input into, into engaging young people or trying to provide for, for, for employment and jobs? And which areas do you think are key into, into the sector of growth? Yeah, thank you. Um, there's the issue of agricultural, agricultural advancement, because agriculture plays a key role in the economy as a well, whole, but also majorly it employs very many young people, especially the illiterate and semi-literate. But even now the, the literates have joined agriculture. Um, I think there needs to be, there needs to be um, an increase in the pool of funds available to be accessed by not only young people, but also women and, and, and farmers as, as a whole. There needs to be an increase in, this, in the funds accessed by these people, such that they can invest more in, in their produce to even actually add value to their produce. Because right now, there's a lot of subsistence farming. The president talks about it every other day, but little intervention has been made to improve the quality of life of the farmers. So there is there's need to provide more, more, more credit, more credit to, to young people, to women in rural areas, and also to all people that would like to engage in, in agriculture. Uh, corruption plays a very, a very a major, a major <coughs> role in undermining all of these efforts. And it is in every sector, like Professor Mushemeza said here. Until we invest intentionally in fighting corruption and promoting accountability by all officers and all implementers in society, there is going to be, we are all, always going to be backlashing on everything that we, that we intend to do. Um, in regards to the economy, we have, we had tourism as one of the key, uh, of the key sectors that brought in revenue, that brought in money. And definitely this has been threatened by COVID-19, but there still have to be efforts to promote number one, to promote Uganda as a, as a tourist destination externally, but also to promote domestic tourism. Uh, and promoting tourism externally calls for, calls for intentional reduction of political anxiety and political tension, because once once all these clips of, of, of the media being battered, of citizens being witch hunted, go to the outside world, it definitely uh, plays in the, the negative of the tourism sector in Uganda. So it is important for government to, to because tourism and agriculture play a very a, a key role. I know people who used to export produce to countries outside of Uganda. And of course, this was, this was threatened by COVID-19. Some of the businesses stopped. And now there is, there is need to reinvest in these people, to, 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 to give them better seats, or to, to, to even reduce the tax on, on, on pest control, um, what is it called, pesticides? Pesticides and pest control are mechanisms. So, 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 so government needs to do this quite intentionally and, and with a lot of vigor. Okay, interesting. Uh, professor, you... you at least you've been around in the areas of uh, working, of organizing people, uh, there's the circles, and uh, of course now we need to, to see the employment uh, question. This is, of course, it's, uh, one of the priorities that uh, the citizens who, uh, will be looking at uh, going forward. You, we've just had uh, at the, the start of elections, we, we saw, uh, the Mioga kind of project coming through. Do you, you think, what is the discipline that we could pick from? You know you've, you've started, you started the SAPA, I think, I, I believe that uh, it's one of the, the strongest in your region. Uh, which discipline do you think can, can, can we can incorporate into for, for, for some of these schemes that are, that are failing, that government is putting up and failing, yet they're supposed to, to, to help, uh, offer solutions to people? 
the concept of a circle is to uh, encourage citizens do savings, manage their own finances, and uh, put in their productive activities. Uh, but one of the challenges of the circles they face is uh, access to big monies at a low interest rate. I think microfinance support center is saying they have money, but their interest is still very high. So if a circle borrows money from microfinance support center and is also supposed to lend it to its members, given the interest rates, then, and you're engaged in agriculture, which has vagaries of whether uh, there is a period you can produce, then there is still a problem there. So we want to see government providing capital through institutions like microfinance support centers at a low interest rate, with even a gestation period, like in agriculture, whether you give them like eight months before they begin paying. Now, the concept of emyoga is good, but when I look at the money that is involved, there is going to be very little impact. If you are going to provide 30 million to all the emyoga groups in the constituency, by the time the group share the money, it will be one million. What will that money do? So the concept is good, because the idea is that get this money which has been scattered in various programs of government and is being stolen, and bring it closer to the citizens. So that concept is OK. But the amounts that are involved is very little. Even if you gave 30 million to a very serious group, still that money is very little. So we have to rethink the concept of beggar in terms of the capital that is involved, even if you start with fewer groups, so that they can make an impact. But the way it is now, we are likely not to see a bigger impact. Because the funds involved and the groups that have been formed, the money is very little. And we also need to sensitize people. Sensitize people to know that they, 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 like they are expected to pay 20,000, I think now 40,000 each member of the group. The concept is that you, 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 you also part, you are contributing to, your, to the, the money you are going to be given. There is a need more to be sensitized. Some people have already dropped out that why are they asking us money? Now, if somebody cannot pay 20,000, already the thinking is that there is free money. Now, if you take it as free, ma free money, it will be like the Entandukwa money, which was seen like what the Baganda would say, Kasimo. So, but the whole idea in terms of uh, economic transformation is how can citizens access cheaper credit. Because in some countries like India where they have made some, uh, uh, some headway in terms of circles, the citizens through their groups are able to access state capital at a low interest rate. And when we talk of positive fiscal policies <coughs> of the state, you are looking at issue of taxation, you are looking at the interest rate that uh, is originated by the Bank of Uganda and subsequently by the commercial banks. So a physical and a monetary policy that will not lower government expenditure, that will not lower interest rates to the affordability of citizens, then that policy is not making a positive impact in terms of growth of the economy. Red 15.4 has to go into servicing the external debt. And we have a constant uh, cost of the wage bill, which, are, which, which is five trillion, that doesn't change. So it means, therefore, what we are going to collect from URA is only enough to, to service the external debt and pay the wage bill, and the money is finished. So where are we going to get the money? We are talking about Mioga. We are going to want to invest in people. We want to continue with the investing in infrastructure. We want better health, better education, better everything. So uh, for a country like Uganda, which is living beyond its means. Because you have a budget, you are planning to spend much more you can generate. Some of the things, I, I know economists will explain, but I think these are some of the things, again, we would want to see government be, 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 be
be being more disciplined about and uh, uh, above all the, the issues we spoke about here the issue of the thieves the men and women who have made it their daily business to steal public money these have to i think take refuge to take holiday sorry take holiday in order for us to overcome some of these challenges at a time when the public expenditure is growing we have more districts more constituencies more mps more everything so i think we need to get more, more disciplined in terms of spending uh, we observed during the elections eh? the president the incumbent had about to uh, about 10 convoys in the field and each convoy has about 20 vehicles all this wasteful expenditure has to be reduced. We do know from the, the, the budget of 2021-2022 that classified expenditure stands at 4.8 trillion. It was 3.8 trillion in 2020-2021. In it was 2.8 in 2019-2020. So there's been an increment of, of 1 trillion uh, going into classified expenditure at a time when we are not at war. So these are some of the things that I think <clears throat> the discipline we have to go back to. And of course, we look forward to some uh, progressive uh, legislators such as Professor Mushemeza to make sure that when you get into parliament, some of these things uh, should be resisted or something. I can see we may not increasingly get funds from outside. Huh? Because now if you look at like Minister of Health, much of their budget, in a number of things is from development partners. Suppose they withdrew their money, what happens? So we have to learn to be self-reliant. And we, to be self-reliant, we must create an enabling environment that will enable us to expand the tax base and collect more. And also being prudent, as you are saying, discipline. We have to look at the, the way we spend our money we can have priorities among priorities. There are things we may need to do away with. Like the idea of uh, these institutions, uh, a number of uh, institutions, uh, boards, uh, that are expected to be amalgamated. But if we also don't fight corruption, the process of amalgamating them can also be consumed. Eh? can be consumed by corruption. So, looking at government expenditure, that is an aspect of physical policy. You know, sometimes when people hear physical policy, they think it is like a mountain. No, you are talking about government expenditure, you are talking about taxes. <laughs> you are talking about taxes. So, we have to look at what are the priorities among priorities. And beginning with ourselves as leaders, beginning as our lead, as leaders is very important. How do we pay ourselves? Eh? That is very critical. There is a very big disparity. A driver in an organization earning more than a professor yes. in the university. These are things we need to address. We need to bridge these gaps. The issue of a living wage. If we are talking about uh, citizens' agenda, yes. workers, we must address the issue of a living wage. Where do we get the money? Bridging these gaps. Why should some people be paid very highly when others are, are, are peanuts? Mm -hmm. If it means looking at qualification, let it be. If there are to be allowances for specialized activities, like scientists, that can be worked out. I know the, the, the regime did promise that uh, we shall have middle income status in 2020, and I don't know whether it's the locusts <laughs> that, <laughs> and the the, the locusts that they came towards the end of the year that <laughs> took it away. But uh, away from that, we have seven districts in Uganda that have attained lower middle income status. Uh, and five of these seven districts that have attained in middle income status in Uganda we are won by noob, by opposition. And these are Kampara, Mukono, Oachiso, Mpiji, and Masaka. So you can as well say that attaining middle income status, you know, people who are in the middle income status voted for, for, for Honare Bochagurani. But without any, and, and outside the, uh, outside the, the, the noob base, then you have Umbara and Guru at the other districts that have attained middle income status in this country. 
So if, if as a country, our target, and, and going back to the promises of, of Sanja Hakuna Mchezo, uh, as uh, President Museven has had laid down his priorities after swearing in, in 2016, I think out of those priorities, if, if we could score him and try to lay a forecast of, on where his new term, you know, the concentration, the concentration might be, I, I think what he managed to deliver on intentionally was the, the Uganda Airlines, the bombardiers. Because part of Chanja Hakuna Mchezo was middle income status, re-establishment of, of uh, Uganda Airlines, fighting corruption, which I, th I don't know how to score him. Because I know there are people who are protected and then there are those that must be prosecuted. You know, that selective application of, of laws and double standards in our fight towards corruption and lack of commitment, including, so you have the term of Sanja Hakuna Mchezo, where fighting corruption was number two. Because even the slogan that Sanja Hakuna Mchezo was meaning that I am done with games. This is the term of no games. But, but President Museven is concluding his own term of Sanja Hakuna Mchezo at a more joking subject of absence of IGG. <laughs> and take away power from the center, because that was the original purpose of decentralization in this country. Then there are a lot of useless and patronage offices that must be closed. I think that the regime needs to focus on making an economy that works and making people, making it easier for people to find jobs than creating institutions to give your people jobs. We are starting off a, a new year. We are, we are, we, we are saying uh, there's life coming back in, into into normal uh, normality. So we we're trying to see uh, how best do you think uh, the economy can quickly adopt uh, amidst uh, this pandemic. Well, just just briefly on, on the topics that has just been on, you know, mm. on the table. It is it is unfortunate how the cost of public administration exerts a lot of pressure on our already bleeding budget. Like my fellow panelists here said, um, this unreasonable number of constituencies, sub-counties, it actually is unfortunate that they do not actually take services to the people. If you look at the National Youth Council, for example, it has councils, committees from village level, which, have no, which do not feel an inch or even a pinch of the budget, of the national budget, even at sub-county level, actually. The budget only goes to the district, and it's strictly for meetings. So if we have money to facilitate only meetings, then what happens after the meetings? What do people do after the meetings? So um, getting back to your question, number one, we need so the question, needs to before, be... Before you get, do, yeah. so meaning that uh, the funding that is, in the, in the, in the, in the, that is sent into does not actually do its purpose. Yeah, because, because our priorities as a country yes. are quite different. Mm -hmm. There is a there is a regime need number one to stand power to create more constituencies to have so many MPs come up, but this comes at the cost of, of the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we need cars for the MPs. Every district comes with a car. There are DC with a woman MP with. But you know, you can build a health center for hospitals. We can build health center for and hospitals without necessarily having a district. You know. So the cost of public administration altogether is, is very unfortunate. We need to, we could have, we could actually divert these funds to more, to more reasonable, to more reasonable sectors in our economy. For example, the country could have a budget where it prioritizes education of its citizens, health, infrastructure, and agriculture from money that actually could be collected from within the country. But if the, if the budget, the, the, the national budget is looking elsewhere. Basically, our sources of income are going to be elsewhere to cater for priority areas. Then it's unfortunate. Our domestic, our debt burden will be 52 percent of GDP. So it's above the maximum because the maximum recommended is 50 percent, and now we are going into 52 percent. And we have no money now to finance to financial year 2021-2022. We have to go into borrowing. 
you see so the, we are not we are we are in a situation that is not really pleasant as a country and citizens have to to not say to to take this note of this because so part of the priorities of the citizens will be now also the infrastructure we are seeing uh, issues in uh, but the infrastructure the, the, the what? you know that there is that talk damien of, of yes it's good to have good roads but but in uh, development economics a road must have benefits. If you look at the original road network for Uganda, the road had an economic purpose. So you had the railway going to Kasese to pick copper okay. and whatever was mined there, yes. but also facilitated the cash crop economy in, in, in Kasese, including cotton. Mm. Then you have the road network going to the north, and there were particular products that should have moved on that road. So the, the, the road network should facilitate movement of goods and services. I have driven on several accounts on, 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 on the beautiful road to Mbari. I know there were roadworks, but it has been a good road generally. And the same good road in, you, passing through Movende to Fort Poto. On a weekday, you can ride alone from Kampala to Fort Poto, and there is no car on the road. And that is one of the best roads. So what is the economic benefit of that road? When you go to Mbari, people are drying cassava on the road. Is that the purpose for which it was made? So once you say, you sloganeer into, we are making roads, we are making roads, without specific encouragement of production to make an economic benefit of that road, it is a waste of time. And the same can be said of the express highway. For example, it is not beneficial for any company to bid to correct the road to an express highway. Each time I'm on that road, you have three, four other cars moving with you. Only. And they are going to the airport. So if a company won a bid to correct the road to on that road, yes, you will only meet cars rushing to the airport. So how much money do you collect and can you make your ends meet? I know there is a French company coming and at first we are uncomfortable under the slogan of Bubu, you know, build the Uganda and, and whatever. So people said, no, but you cannot make money on that road. There is no traffic. So you need to look at what is the planning. You are making a road connecting with which network, transporting what, and what is the economic benefit of that infrastructure. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. We, 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 we can reduce on the investment of, of roads now yeah. and invest in agro-industrialization. But if you invested in agro-industrialization without roads, you also face a problem. It used to take me, when I was coming to the university in 1984, starting from Vushenyi at 6, you reach Kampara at 6 p.m. The whole day. Of course, that was not very present. So it is not a mistake that the roads have been put in place. They should be but balanced. we need, now there is a need of, 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 of balance. Yeah. We need to invest in health. We need to invest in agro-industrialization. Yeah. The young people and people all together are looking for inclusive, inclusive policies, uh, conducive and inclusive policies in terms of taxation and government expenditure. Uh, young people are looking for employment opportunities whether in government or the private sector, and government can trigger that by, uh, by making the space more conducive for investment, and also by increasing the pool of credit facilities, and also uh, lowering the, the lending rates or borrowing rates for young people, and increasing funds in youth livelihood program and things like that. Employment opportunities are employment altogether, is a, major, is a major factor in the development of the young people and the nation at large. Value addition to produce and also um, emphasizing advancement of technology and agriculture. Respect of fundamental freedoms and human rights should be a non-partisan issue. Issue of national security should be a non-partisan issue. And finally, fighting corruption should be a non-partisan issue. Professional conduct of security forces. And, and I hope the command in chief who has remained permanent now going into 40 years really appreciates the need to have a professional, a professional army. Because among his 10 points program and, and his book on why he waged the protracted war, 
was to fight the partisan and an unprofessional army. So it will be really very absurd given the amount of investment Ugandans and partners have put into building the professionalism of the army, hoping that Uganda can, for the first time, have an army that outlive the regime and the leader, and for him to end on the very note of the very reason that he went to the bush would be very absurd, not only for himself, <laughs> but for Uganda, Ugandans and our partners in diaspora and everywhere. And, and, and the third aspect is really to prioritize development and the well-being of a citizen as compared to patronage and building just patronage pa networks to keep in power as, as compared to serving the people. And, and, and I will conclude on the same note like my colleagues is to stop wastage of public resources through fighting corruption. The time has come for us to introduce the function of audit in our elections, that when the Electoral Commission is tabulating the results as transmitted from the, from the districts, there should be an audit of the manner in which they have added up so that we can, we, we, we can improve on the quality of our elections. Number two uh, is peace. Ugandans need peace. And the peace does not merely mean absence of war. When we, 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 we have the anxieties, the pains of people disappearing, the poverty uh, in which people have been wallowing for a long time, you cannot talk about peace. So let's invest in people, let's uh, have peace, uh, because Ugandans want peace. We hope to continuously have these uh, engagements. And of course they continue on our, on our social spaces, on our WhatsApp group, the Citizens Chat Room, we go on to YouTube, we are there, Civic Space TV, we are there, and all the other uh, uh, so social media channels of uh, the Center for Constitutional Governance. So from today, uh, being the host, uh, I would want to say thank you for, for being with me, and uh, we hope to continue this uh, conversation the next time. Every, we try to see if we can have these conversations, these conversations go on every uh, week, every Friday, if possible. We hope to, to see you again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening.